This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living out the Catholic faith, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now, your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor at Sacred Heart Parish and rector of the Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother. There at the shrine the other day, I saw something that I took note of. It wasn't something I hadn't seen before, but I hadn't seen it directly at the shrine. It, I had taken note of it in other places at other times, and I'll describe it in a moment. But in case you don't know about the shrine, it's built to honor the example of Blessed Stanley Rother, a priest of this archdiocese, murdered at his mission in Santiago Atitlan, Guatemala in 1981. Father Rother was beatified in 2017. The process of canonization is ongoing. The shrine was built in order to honor his example and to promote the cause of his canonization, as well as to be a place of pilgrimage where each person is invited to encounter the Lord in a more intimate way, especially through the extraordinary witness of Blessed Stanley's life and ministry. To accomplish this, the shrine was built with the main body of the church as well as a special chapel. In this chapel, the body of Blessed Stanley is interred in the altar. Following a very old Roman custom as we celebrate Mass, we're actually celebrating at the altar containing the body of the martyr. This is a practice that we know through documentation that goes back to the third century. And it was practiced even earlier than that is certain. There's something truly transcendent about the connection between the celebration of and the reception of the body and the blood of the Lord and the example of the one whose body was offered as a sacrifice in the name of faithfulness to Jesus' example. This has been a theme of Christian martyrdom since the beginning, and it has lived on in the church through the ages until now. St. Peter's Basilica itself in Rome was built over the spot where St. Peter was buried after his execution. When the Pope says Mass at the high altar there, he's saying Mass over the place where the first of the apostles was buried after he had offered his body in imitation of Jesus' own sacrifice. In addition, in the chapel, there is a very fine statue of Blessed Stanley, and in the base of the statue, there is a relic enshrined there. It's a very small piece of bone from Father Stanley's body placed in a small reliquary in the base. The altar is not accessible to the casual visitor, but the statue is. In fact, it was designed to be accessible. The reliquary was placed pretty much at eye level so that anyone who regarded the statue would also notice the relic. That's how the chapel's arranged. It was built so as to be a, a place of particular intimacy with the life and the example of Father Rother. It's a small area available for mass and adoration and benediction every day a quiet place of prayer and devotion for pilgrims who can come in to enjoy the silence, the presence of the blessed, and the sanctity of the Lord's presence there. What I notice about the chapel, and I'm always surprised by, is how quiet it is. The traffic on I-35 thunders by all day and all night, just a few hundred yards away. Especially at rush hour, the noise can be deafening. But in the chapel, all is quiet. It's a place where we're all invited to realize the whole purpose of the shrine, which is a place of special encounter with the mercy of the Lord and the gift of his graces. And I'll tell you another feeling I have there in the chapel, and this is true of all Catholic churches, not just the chapel at the shrine, but these days I spend much more time in the chapel than just about any other church space. So it applies for me especially strongly there, and it's this. Because we light the sanctuary candle to note the Eucharistic presence of the Lord in the tabernacle, the small flame of the candle is burning at all times. If you go in when the lights are down, it's easy to see the flame flicker in the space there. And I always feel that by looking at the flickering light, it is as if the space is breathing there. There's a real presence there. I know, and I hasten to affirm, it's simply my feeling. It has nothing to do with doctrine or teaching. I know there isn't a breathing presence in the room. All those things are true. But in my artistic sensibility and in the capacious awareness of my intellect, the wavering candle flame is a reminder of the thickness of the space and the promise of life and presence there. 
This small candle is a sign of something else, not just merely a reminder, but a symbol of what's harbored there. In fact, I love to go into churches in the dark and sit there in the dark with nothing lit but the space at the tabernacle, the sanctuary lamp warming the darkness. It's a feeling of true intimacy and accompaniment, and I find it to be just as true in giant cathedrals as much in small chapels, as real in the glow of the candlelight during the songs before Christmas midnight mass as in the solitary glow of an unlocked church in the dark of the morning. The famous monk and writer Thomas Merton described coming across a chapel in New York City when he was a student at Columbia University. This would have been in the mid-1930s and how much it moved his pagan heart. He had no idea what it symbolized or what it meant, just as he had no real appreciation of what church was, beyond it being a place where believers sat down and listened on Sunday morning. But coming into the space and encountering the thick, warm, and comforting awareness of a presence there made a difference to him. When he wrote his autobiography, Seven Story Mountain, he made mention of this moment. He wouldn't go so far as to say it was the beginning of his conversion, but it did play a part in making him aware of what was going on in his heart. And the most interesting thing of all, as he was writing about it, was that he knew as a super bright, hungry for success, hugely, hugely educated young man, that any ordinary working man had this experience available to him as well. He knew this place he visited at that chapel there was a chapel much visited by ordinary Catholics as part of their daily routine. As he looked back over his shoulders at this brief moment in his life, he wrote that there was a brief moment of envy in his soul as he went into that space. He actually envied those who had received this experience as their heritage. He didn't know anything about the faith, and he knew enough to know it meant something to those who went to visit and kneel down there, but he knew it was not his house, and he was accepting of it. But he knew that those for whom it was their house had something he didn't have. As it turned out, in the rest of his autobiography, he spent the next years looking to find what it was they had, and it was disclosed to him in that one candle flame, which is, I think, what I experience when I go into a chapel and sit or kneel and am aware of the thick, comforting space there, inviting me to receive the life in that space and inviting me to leave the emptiness of my own confusions and uncertainties behind as I spend my time there. The chapel really is carved out of the space of the world, and it's a place separate from the rest of the space everywhere. It really is a sacred space, a space and sense of the sacred I don't encounter anywhere else. And I think none of the rest of us do. And I've read enough books to know this sense of relief, which Thomas Merton described, is because we all hunger for a place like this. We all hunger for it in our hearts. Everyone, if they have a moment to actually touch what's going on in their heart of hearts, they want to feel this same sense of comfort as well, that feeling of a thick, insulating space there. So when it's there in the chapel, we all respond to it the way a child responds to a smiling face or an adult to a gesture to draw closer. There's something to spaces and what they contain. And again, I found this to be true in giant cavernous cathedrals built a thousand years ago as much as in small, intimate chapels tailored for individual tastes and private piety. And to disclose another of my experiences, I especially love those chapels in Rome that are the churches built in the 7th to the 10th centuries there. They have in those thousand-plus-year-old spaces a kind of breadth and intensity that builds on these other factors. When I come to uh, lighting a flame in my heart, I much prefer the stark, barren stones of one of the 7th century churches nestled up to the Tiber than to the Baroque fineness of the churches on the Corso in the middle of Rome. But that's just me. At any rate, in this small chapel that we have at the shrine, I saw a woman the other day there with what looked like her granddaughter. They were both looking at the statue of Father Stanley, which stands on its pedestal in the back of the chapel. I could see she was explaining what they were seeing to the little child who was with her. And then, in the midst of her explanation, she took her rosary and touched it to the small relic at the base of the statue. It was a simple, small gesture, but it captured something rich and human. It took only a moment, but it disclosed something so powerful in our souls. 
because what she was doing was communicating her hunger for holiness and her desire for intimacy. She also disclosed her awareness of how blessed Stanley's life helps to bring the promise of holiness and intimacy with God to light. I thought about that moment as she touched her rosary to the relic for a good while. It was a simple, natural gesture. She didn't do it in order to be noticed or even because she thought it was somehow required. It was because of what the rosary and the relic mean to her that she did what she did. And of course, that this was done with her granddaughter there spoke volumes to me. Most of us have been raised at a very odd time in the life of the church. Over these last couple of hundred years, we who have Northern European ancestors have been socialized into a world in which we put a premium on ideas and concepts, and we trust what we read and analyze more than we trust anything else. Our world is one of credentials at universities and out of books, a world in which who wrote what and what someone said about the ideas someone else wrote about is the most important kind of things there are. The life of the mind is paramount and to be valued more than any other aspect of what it means to be human. This is our culture, which means we don't have to be raging intellectuals ourselves to breathe in the fumes of these values. They're all around us, and they touch us whether we ever spent one day in a college classroom or indeed actually spent much time reading a book. If you need any proof, just look at Facebook. You might see a million pictures and the occasional video, but what you see more than anything else is people talking to one another and talking to each other about what they've read or thought or seen of what someone else has read or thought or seen. No matter what else it is, it's a place on the internet in which everyone is drowning in words. That's what kind of people we are. I thought it was captured so well in a small meme I saw a year or two ago. The meme was this. We've had the technology for the telephone for more than 100 years, but now that we have cell phones, it turned out that what we really wanted to do was just write short letters to each other, talking about people who text back and forth. I love that. We really are adrift in a sea of words. We write back and forth to one another, adding on and editing and recasting what we've been given and what we want to say, which means we don't put all that much attention on the other aspects of what it means to be human. We don't appreciate actions and gestures and feelings all that much. The value of what a person can feel or what they can taste or how they get along in the crisscross of life seems to be very much less important than to say the right words at the right time. My friend Gil Bailey once proposed the choice we face as he described one of the phases of his life. He said, we're faced with the choice of being able to say the right thing at the right time or to be able to do the right thing at the right time. In our world, in this part of the Christian society we've grown up in, we're much more attentive to saying the right words than to doing the right thing. That might sound a bit out of touch, but think about what so, think about what so much of the pride propaganda is really about. A gigantic part of the effort of Pride Month is has to do with being sure everybody says exactly the right thing. The sea of words has to coalesce in exactly the right way, or else, they say, we don't have a place in society. And the measure imposed upon us is not what we do, but what we say. Isn't that interesting? In this version of social religion, which is what Pride Month is really all about, we're required to say the right things in the right way, or else we won't fit in the right way. Now, it's not Christian religion, but it's a version of the religion of the day, and it's a lot like the religious environment we learn to swim in. But in most of Christian history, things weren't that way. It wasn't so important to say things the right way. It was most important to feel things in a particular manner and to act in an acceptable way. That sounds simple, and in describing them, it sounds incomplete. After all, what's so special about feeling things? And we all know how fragile it is to make the connection between believing and feeling and doing. But feeling and doing are at the heart of being human and thus as the heart of what it means to be a believer. So for most of Christian history, believers were focused on what they felt and on what they did. 
Most people didn't have access to education and information. They guided themselves in their decisions based on the part of life they had access to, which was mostly the content of their feelings and the feelings of others, as well as the gestures and the roles they learned. Faith and its content had to do with those things, not with the exacts, words, and thoughts they had. Again, these sound insubstantial and confusing, but only because we're bathed in the sea of words and don't know another way to live. I'll give you an example. When I was young, my mother strove to go to Mass every day that she could. It was the same with my grandmother, her mother. They were very attentive to the holiness of Mass and all, and, and all that it promised to them, and they were certainly attuned to the value of that kind of worship in their lives. But if you'd asked my grandmother what the words Agnus Dei meant, or what language the words Kyrie eleison were in. She, she had to confess she didn't know, but she would also have confessed that she was pretty angry that she might be expected to know. Answering questions or knowing the right way to respond was not part of her life of faith. You might as well have asked her how she knew exactly how much her husband loved her or exactly how much time off she deserved after harvest season. Those were questions that made no sense because they were questions that had no place. She didn't live in a world in which there was a quantity to those measures. Her concern her concern was what was done and how she was to act. And just to be clear, that meant she also measured her life by how she fed the hungry and took care of the poor not just how often she went to Mass. Her life was measured in gestures and decisions. In the other part of Christian life, this more traditional and historically preceded way to live out the life of the faith, responding by way of emotions and feelings, is important. So, coming back to the woman and her granddaughter at the statue in the chapel of the shrine, she lifted her rosary up to the relic of Blessed Stanley Rother because she wanted this blessed item she used for prayer to have touched the visible and actual reminder of the life and holiness of Blessed Stanley. She felt this presence, she was, she felt this presence. She was attuned to the reality of the example of holiness and witness that was suffusing the chapel space there. And she wanted it to be something palpable, something real, something she touched. She wasn't looking for an idea. She wasn't closing in on an argument, and she wasn't answering a question. She was drawing close to Blessed Father Stanley Rother's life of holiness. For her, it was a gateway to the gift of holiness in her life. It's a simple gesture, I know, and anyone can make it. And gestures can be as empty and formless. They can be nothing more than mere movement, vacuous from beginning to end. We all know that's true. But you know, words can be the same. How many times have we been honest with ourselves and admitted that the words we've said were empty empty and meaningless to ourselves, even while we were saying them? A gesture also can be empty, but it also has the power to communicate and to transmit meaning just as thoroughly and just as completely as any other human experience, including speech. And her brief moment at the statue was, for me, a lesson in what we should all pay more attention to. In her mind, the life of Blessed Stanley is one on which the message of Christ is on display. He opened his life to Christ's will when he, when he responded to the call to become a priest. He lived out that call as a missionary, and he deepened his connection to Christ by the suffering he endured as he served his people. And eventually, he sealed his deep identification with Christ when he was martyred for the faith. He gave his life as witness in blood of the promise that the meaning of life is larger than living. And he has and has its only meaning in the example of Christ. And Stan lived this purpose and faith by the choices he made in his life. The relic she could touch was a connection to the life that he had lived. And because it was a real connection, it connected her to the same promise and the same gift that prompted Stan's life. For her, this gesture was something like, Closing an electrical circuit, once you touch two wires, the charge can flow through both of them, and they become one circuit. She touched Stan, Stan's example, literally, and its blessedness could flow into her. The truth of the matter is that the entire shrine was built just exactly for what this grandmother was seeking. It wasn't built to be a museum to Blessed Stanley. 
It does have a museum, and we're proud of all the pictures and items from Stan's life that it contains. And in the church and chapel, we celebrate his life and the influences that moved him. We have statues of missionary saints and of apostles. We celebrate the very architecture of the place and time in which he served. But that's foreground, an invitation to take a look. The background is the invitation to encounter the life of Christ. That's why Stan's life was notable. It's what he was witnessing to when he poured out his life in martyrdom. So the shrine exists in order for every pilgrim to be invited into a deeper relationship with the sources of Stan's life, which is the life of Christ. Stan is the window through which we see the landscape, the pot thrown by the potter. This grandmother knew as she touched that she knew that if she touched this small relic, she touched something of the life of holiness and goodness And that life was right in front of her. To tell the truth, it's an invitation to all of us. Come to the shrine to be bathed in the example of holiness swirling about there. Come and note the statue and the relics and the altar and the chapel, the beauty of the proportions and the lift of the architecture. Tour the museum and note the gift of Blessed Stanley's life. Walk the grounds to appreciate the place given over to the gift of space and possibility. And above all, come into the chapel and enjoy the silence there. All these things are so that a door can open in your life, a door already present in your heart, waiting to swing out and to allow in what's offered there. You don't have to touch the relic, but come in and allow yourself to be touched by what it discloses. You might find that there is a real connection to the promise of Stan's life lived in holiness in your life. When the circuit closes, you know, it can be a real shock. And no, gestures are what life is formed by. In the medieval world, at one of the most popular and important shrines to Mary in all of Europe, at Our Lady of Walsingham in England, even the royalty came to, to uh, pray and to show their respects. They would come and walk a pilgrim journey there to the chapel, dedicated to the life and holiness of the Blessed Virgin. Even the royals would begin their pilgrim journey of prayer by going to a small chapel and taking off their shoes as they began walking because the journey was on holy ground. The little church there came to be known and is still known as the Slipper Chapel. It's still there. Later on, people laughed at that kind of piety. It meant nothing, they said. Right belief, they thought, is better than mere gestures. Right answers, much better than mere prayers. But think about it. Would the world be better off today if even royals came to walk the path of holiness in bare feet? I tend to think it would. I think if we allowed little moments to touch us and touch the moments that could make us holy, the whole world might be better off as well. Back in just a moment. Welcome back to our final segment, Faith in Verse. We have a poem today called, After the Garden. The glory of the Lord descended to fill the new-formed earth, and the beauty of the divine creation was everywhere. Glowing with the graciousness of the holy come to birth, the world was contoured and shaped with godly care. We have hints of this in those aha moments, taken by surprise when we stumble across them. Amid the chaos of data crowding our senses, there suddenly the glowing, the original glow of clarity descends. We know we're woven into the original order. Beauty universal is ours to behold and to embrace. God, even in broken symmetry, does not stint or hoard, but allows the beauty to reflect from his face. This is the source of the greatness of our senses, true insight, an awakening given even to the smallest of us. The correspondence of wonderful beauty, peace, and light, soothing the bitters of sin and the devastation of loss. That's After the Garden. All of us have these opportunities to experience the presence and the power of the Lord in our lives. That's what we try to explore here on our program. I hope that in the weeks to come that you might be able to join us for what it means to be Living Catholic. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit OKCR.org.